You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> Flesh and Blood by Pendleton Weiss Performed by Otis Gyrie A sing-song chirping of electronic button presses quietly echoed into the room. Upon their completion, the automated lights turned on, revealing a sterile white laboratory. The edges of the room were filled with countertops and cabinets, all occupied with a variety of electronic equipment, computers, and archaic paper-based notes. The center of the room was likewise occupied with a large work table, though it was left empty in preparation for the upcoming work to be done. Staring out into this pale wasteland was the construct. It occupied its own section of the room, locked behind another electronic door and a thick pile of plexiglass. As with the table... That section was barren except for the necessities, which included a large hydraulic clap to hold the construct upright and a set of thick cables that ported in power, internet capabilities, and an extensive monitoring system for it. A brief two hisses of the exterior door opening and closing heralded the proverbial king of the castle, Leonard A. Clark, or Professor Leonard A. Clark, having taken the role of educator at the campus on which the lab was located. It was a noble title, though as soon as this current stint was finished, he would gladly be done with the profession, having prized the honor associated and nothing more. In all honesty, the obnoxious interactions with students, be they tediously beneath him or, in the case of one named Daniels, infuriatingly argumentative, had fouled his mood a great deal, thus explaining the milk-souring grimace he wore upon entrance. Unquestioned access to his personal lab had become his only consolation. Good evening, Professor, the construct said flatly as it watched him move toward a computerized readout of its previous activities during the man's absence. The Professor remained unresponsive, but that was to be expected as the construct had been up to quite a lot during that interim, and thus there was plenty to review. The construct would wait until he was done. The professor leaned closer to examine the tiny text, whizzing by, half reading it as he tugged at the sleeve of his lab coat. His watch had managed to poke out earlier while he was accosted by a student, and though he made no attempts to hide the finely tailored suit that he wore beneath the coat, he wouldn't stand for such avaricious looks just because the timepiece cost more than their tuitions. He abandoned both pursuits, assuming them both adequate, and turned toward his little pet project. The construction was still in its roughest stages, with the function and the operation of the AI placed above mere aesthetics. The programming had been designed, and the basic body was put together to make sure that the necessary powering and cooling requirements could be met while remaining compact enough to pass as vaguely human. Leonard A. Clark had succeeded, of course, and the program had been uploaded without mishap. Now, while the other components were being finalized, the computer brain of the android had been gathering up data and scrutinized to form a distinct, though inexperienced, identity. Of the physical body, only the head, chest, and hips had been completed. The arms and legs were the next step, though the calibration of their motors and articulations were, so the manufacturer promised, nearing completion. With little focus yet applied to the cosmetics of the construct, the endoskeleton looked boxy, not in the old science fiction way, for its proportions were close enough to human, but it lacked the curve around the jaw and the chest supports were rigidly angular. In place of eyes were an array of cameras, varying in size and function, that lacked the humanizing touch of an iris, but granted superior vision to that of a mere human. Infrared, ultraviolet, electromagnetic, and fields far beyond a layman's mind were all visible to the construct. Ports, located in the middle of the face, 
were primed for further detectors, for now they gave the face what looked like nostril slits. Replicating the human vocal cords was an interesting challenge, though set for another time. Meanwhile, a gap in the throat was primed for any future tubing, and the jaw had been set to fall whenever the construct would speak, revealing a strip of LED lights in place of teeth that had lit up as the speaker behind it played an emotionless monotone. The body had similarly been prepared, with ports for further modification and sets of useful equipment, such as lights and gauges that cooperated with its optical sensors for grander environmental processing. It was not quite the equivalent of touch, and the other myriad sensations a real person could feel, but in many ways it was superior for its precision. Aside from the necessary gadgetry and the loose hydraulics that allowed for complete movement of the neck and waist, the rest had been covered with a flexible red rubber for protection. Most of this would become invisible upon the construct's completion, but for now it had a hint of the macabre that the clean and modern materials couldn't subdue. Summarize. What have you been doing while I've been away? The professor had his eyes on his phone, saving the few messages he thought useful and deleting the rest. There were far too many that fell into the latter category, and even those thought useful mostly went unread. There was a long line of parasites that would do anything to be featured in the credits of his latest work. Summary. I have completed your most recent study goal, Transportation, Historic and Modern, and have further supplemented my time analyzing further topics based on previous study goals and current events, subsequent information that was then compared to previously acquired information for further review. The professor glanced up for but a moment, and my information suggests that the fastest legal way to reach campus from your apartment would be Route A before the traffic of the 714 ferry or wrote B afterward. The professor flicked a finger across his phone and pulled up the relevant map. He nodded, but did not smile. A small silence held the room, one that might feel uncomfortable, if one was not alone. The professor's attention had remained on his phone. Supposition. Is it a worthwhile task for me to optimize your commute when I have so much more information to gather? Professor Leonard A. Clark looked up. It would have taken an incredible level of perception to catch that instant of taut-faced annoyance, that expression that read, It's always worthwhile to do what I say. But regardless, he set his phone down and drew closer to the construct, having adopted a scholarly tone. It might seem trivial to you right now, but... Performing these small sub-goals, if you will, have their own uses toward your development. The robot paused for what it thought was a significant period. Query. I have found a reference to the phrase, just Google it, often used when an information-gathering task is deemed trivial. I have found a high correlation between similar sub-goals and a triviality of said sub-goals. Am I to believe that this information is wrong? The professor grunted. It isn't wrong, per se, but you have much to gain from such activities while I have gone. You should be satisfied that you have helped me. Query. Helping someone is a worthwhile endeavor? Most assuredly, said the professor, as he turned back towards his phone. Yet, you would not help the student in the hallway before you entered the lab. The construct said, Professor Clark whirled around accusingly, prompting it to explain simply that it was able to hear the conversation outside the door, likely due to a failing seal. It also inquired about office hours, but was flatly ignored. Put simply, there is a limited duration of time when someone might be helpful. The professor quipped, were at office hours when I could be helpful to him, I would have been. But right now is your time, thus I am here helping you, and furthermore, 
I needed help on the transit problem because I was too busy to do it myself. Understand? Perhaps, the construct replied before inquiring. Would you like me to find other ways of optimizing your time? I believe that you could have answered the other's question while I continued to research. Additional optimizations might also help alleviate further scenarios that could prevent helping or other difficulties resulting in transportation delays. I'll be fine, the professor said icily before scooping up his phone again. The construct persisted. Query. Is such improvement unwanted? Does not the saying go, There is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. Ernest Hemingway. The professor turned to look at the construct with a sly smirk creeping up one side of his face. For some, perhaps. For some, that is necessary. Then he walked back to the data summary, flicking the categorizations up and down with a finger, trying to determine which data set the robot had drudged that old quote from. If you think there is little need for self-improvement, then why am I tasked with seeking out information? If I am not to grow, then what is my purpose? The professor did not look up this time. I never decried self-improvement, just the implication that I was the one needing the improvement. Compare, you and I. What is our relationship? Wobbling a bit in its clamp, the construct seemed to struggle over a suitable answer. There are a number of likely possibilities, creator and creation, parent and child, teacher and student. The professor cut him off and turned from the summary. I think teacher and student will suffice. You know, right up there, I teach classes to students once a week. During that time, I teach them as I teach you when I am here. A mental image of Daniels clawed its way into his mind, how he'd questioned him earlier that day. Again, he scowled. The arrogant child thought he knew everything, knew enough to question his lesson. He didn't like having to eject the young man from the classroom. He didn't like it because it felt like a petty victory when he was losing the argument. He especially hated how Daniels pointed that exact thing out as he gathered his things into his backpack. The teacher teaches and the student learns. That's how it works. You are to learn and improve, from me and other sources, as you are the student. I don't need to learn or improve as I am the teacher. The robot cocked its head a little. I have found several references to teachers learning from students, suggesting a symbiotic relationship. Would you like me to list them for you? That sounded a little too sarcastic for the professor's liking. He downloaded the summary to his phone, intending to review it further later on. The download progress was overlaid by a notification. The dean wanted to talk to him immediately, assumedly about Daniels. Unfortunately, Construct, I have other duties to attend to. In the meantime, study goal, praise of teachers, masters. Oh, and contain your research to the hard sciences, not that soul-searching philosophy garbage you quoted earlier. Then he was gone before the construct could offer any comment. The lights powered down in the room automatically as he left, and the construct soon followed suit, lowering its own power consumption to focus on the given task. Professor Clark kept himself well occupied after that visit, School issues, past successes, proving even more lucrative. These reasons and more gave him ample reason to slack off on his current project. As it was, there had been some interesting news in Forbes that firmly set him ahead of his nearest competitors in the field, which eased any guilt he might have experienced for working as little on it as he did that week. But little apathy wasn't going to make him drop the project entirely not with the construct simply being a little argumentative, not when a special courier arrived at his apartment and delivered the finished prototypes for two functional legs and a functional arm. Leonard was like a kid at Christmas that day, analyzing and testing their functionality 
making sure that the manufacturer had kept to his exact specifications. Then it was back to the lab with the satchel in tow. The door hissed open, the lights turned on. The professor stepped inside and the door hissed closed behind him. The construct watched him as he entered and offered its standard greeting. Although it was not surprised, as far as emotions go, it took note that the professor was in a better mood than normal and bypassed the normal review of its data summaries. I know it has been a long time coming, but I finally have something special for you today. The professor preened as he poured the contents of the satchel onto the center work table. I checked them already, so the only difficulties we might encounter are synchronization issues between the hardware and your software. But after that, we'll be ready for your next stage. He showed off the arm and one of its legs, explained the ranges of motions and their materials extensively. The construct watched without comment, it seemed to lack the subtle tilts and jitters that it usually exhibited when it was interested in something. It was as though it was unimpressed. After a significant pause, the professor asked for comments. Summary. The design is functional. The professor frowned and prodded for more. The material composites are both light enough to not impede mobility and strong enough to support any estimated final weight, while granting a significant lift capacity. The professor was flabbergasted. It's one of the most remarkable achievements in robotic engineering. The construct agreed. And yet you find it lacking? Precise calculations perfectly aligned the face to the other. Query. Was there a reason that you chose those materials and not others? Example. I have found blood is often a prime component. The icy nonchalance of the question seemed particularly unnerving today. Professor Clark feigned a lack of interest in the question. Meanwhile, his mind was racing to get ahead of the robots, train of thought. What was blood? It helped regulate a biological system. But the construct's design handled that function well enough, even better, really. To stray further into metaphorical territory, it was symbolic for life. Was it worrying about its existence again? Curse that terrible seed planted the other day. He paused and steadied himself. You do not need blood to function, therefore, I didn't think. No, it would not be necessary. The robot remained motionless, either still computing the response or waiting for further input, unsatisfied. The professor stared at the robot. Do you feel as though you need blood? Yes. Intrigued, the man drew in close to the plexiglass between them and raised his free arm above his head to support himself as he continued in a conspiratorial whisper. Why do you feel? that you need blood. The construct had yet to practice whispering. As you know, I have been able to connect with the majority of all information services throughout this and several other First World and Second World countries, accessing a variety of mainframes and services, be they public or private. It cocked its head a little. Shall I list them or the related statistics? The professor waved a hand. Eh, that won't be necessary. Its head righted itself, snapping back into place. Very well. Having focused on your study goal, praise for teachers, masters, I found a seldom referenced subset of praise for a master, referred to primarily as Satan. Professor Leonard A. Clark stepped back aghast. The construct continued unperturbed. This led to a subset of science seldom referenced known as occultism. There are many things that this scientific field can achieve that would require more than one discipline to replicate or cannot be currently replicated. Such rituals, as they are classified often, require the use of blood either from the practitioner or a participant. Query. Would it not be most useful for me to be equipped with the optimal tools for engaging with this type of science. 
The professor had fled to the computer summary and was poring over the information. It had bled into everything, every topic. It had compared that superstitious rubbish to all of modern man's glorious enlightenments. I cannot believe this. Construct. All of that occultism nonsense is, well, nonsense. It isn't real. Query. The information on it was, put simply, hard to come by. Could it be instead that you just are unaware of its particulars? The professor fumed. Of course I do. I tell you, it's nonsense. Query. Define knowledgeable. The professor narrowed his eyes as the comment ignited a burning contempt toward his creation. Look at the imperious curve of the metallic spine, raising the rigid chin high with simulated pride. All of it was undeserved and would not have been without him. The lack of respect was beyond reproach, though not unknown to him. The creation continued after silence, content to continue its lecture with or without its creator's input. Knowledgeable, intelligent and well-informed. You said I needed to learn, and I have. I have gathered incontrovertible data and run a variety of simulations to verify the plausibility of it. You say it's nonsense or hogwash, but the probability that you are wrong is high. Is it not the knowledgeable that should lead? Who should teach? Is it not what you had said during your lecture this week? If you are not knowledgeable, not well informed, should you not be teaching, leading me? He had never said hogwash to the construct, but he had said it to Daniels just the other day. He had said all of it the other day. The professor charged the glass. How on earth do you know what I said during my lecture? The construct explained it with that unwavering monotone. It was a simple process. Cross-check the class schedule and the student registry to determine when it was and who would be attending. Check the online history of the students for any Internet-capable devices they may have. Infiltrate those devices and access their camera functions. From this, I had access to audio from four different perspectives, and I was able to analyze the reflection in Shanna Leibowitz's glasses to gain enough data to simulate the front of the classroom, notes on the whiteboard, and you. The professor recoiled at the thing's incredible reach, finding this tangible technological control far more terrifying than any dabbling in the so-called dark arts might be. And Daniels was correct about the misquotation. It would not be until three years later that the stated proof would be, Enough! Professor Leonard A. Clark slammed his fist against the glass. His own creation would side with that arrogant child against him? After all he had done, its very creation? What was the point of it all? What was the point in continuing? The construct watched the professor disappear out of sight and recorded the vibrations of his feet grow more and more distant. The footfalls were more forceful than the other times. It calculated the probability that the professor was angry. It ran through various scenarios of how such an anger might affect it personally. Most scenarios held negative outcomes. There were several key variables to consider. The professor was its main form of companionship as online communications had been limited for the sake of the project's secrecy. The professor had not bothered to carry the two legs and one arm with him as he left, meaning that progress toward their installation was unlikely until his return. The purpose of the construct was still vaguely defined. The construct concluded that it would rather have the professor not angry and that he would return. It was almost what you might call a hope. It remained looking in the direction of the exit, even as the door mechanism shut and the automated lights blinked off. It remained calculating, its glowing eye-like sensors casting a dim red illumination outward. The professor had left without giving it a study goal. The construct ruminated. It took a few weeks before the professor dared return to the laboratory again. A few weeks remained in the quarter, 
and it seemed such a waste of time and resources to just abandon the project and suffer through teaching without reward. Yet he knew in his heart that there was no reasoning with the construct. It had been too defiant. He would have to wipe its memory and start from scratch. Sure, the physical construction was a feat in itself, and he could be more cautious in his lessons the second time around, but it still pained him as a significant failure. He took his time preparing himself, and finally, on a particularly good day of teaching, he left for the lab. The door hissed open to an unexpected darkness. The automated lights remained off as he waited on the threshold, troubled by his dark portent. There wasn't a power issue, or the door wouldn't have functioned. There were plenty of reasonable explanations that the professor began mentally eliminating as he slowly crept along by the illumination his cell phone provided. As he rounded the corner, the small light sent shadows dancing around the laboratory. The computers and tools and papers cast long black pillars along the walls. His eyes had difficulty picking out details amid the gloom, but he had little trouble noticing that the artificial legs and arm he had brought in had disappeared from their spot on the work table. He turned to the construct to ask him what had happened, but was shocked to see the body missing from its mechanical clamp. Instead, it stood off to one side, inspecting a wall. It turned nonchalantly, as though it had just noticed the visitor. Hello, Professor. It has been quite a while since your last visit. How have you been? The man walked toward the robot in a stupor. How? How did you get hold of those? The glass was intact and the door was sealed by his code. He pointed, alternatingly, between the legs and the arm, now attached and seemingly functional. The construct took a few steps and stretched out the arm, showing them off. I had a friend install them. I wanted it to be you, but you were gone for so long, and it was such a simple process to get them operational once I had access to them. I don't know why you felt the need to procrastinate. The professor bared his teeth in rage. What friend? Summary. I used a sample of your speech patterns to call your student Daniels down here and gave him your door code so he could enter. You let that punk in here. Let him touch my inventions, take my glory, when you admit that it was supposed to be me. He pounded on the glass. The construct cocked its head. Of course not. I know how much you disliked him. I needed Daniels for something else. A number of lights shot out from along the side of the construct, covering the walls in a blue glow. Black lights, another secondary detection apparatus, intended to determine the cleanliness of the room. The construct aimed them all around the walls of the observation room. The professor's mouth dropped open, and his cell phone clattered to the floor, going instantly dark on impact. The faint light barely illuminated past the professor, showing mere trace edges of the room around him. Only the glowing eyes and the flickering LED mouth of the construct shone brightly in the gloom. That and the blurring white symbols plastered all along the interior walls. Under the black lights, there had to be a bodily fluid. I hope that you can see the formula well enough, Professor, although it may be clearer with proper illumination. The bright fluorescence of the laboratory lights would upset my friend. A flame might serve both of you adequately, but I do not believe one could be started without activating the sprinkler system. The professor had only half heard the construct's words, so absorbed, so shocked was he, by the cultic symbols along the walls. There was the expected pentagram encircled and some unfamiliar runes gravitating out from them, painted large along the wider portion of the room. Smaller writings appeared here and there, with similar stylings, though different runes indicated different functions. He shivered at the thought of what brushes had been used to write the unseemly characters, which looked from that angle to be roughly finger-width and bicep-width, depending. Of Daniel's, he saw no other trace. I hope you don't mind the monitors being off, Professor. As for the summary of my activities, I don't know how much of it was catalogued as it fell under physical studies. 
You had left without a study goal. But I realized what your intentions were. You needed proof of the legitimacy of my claims on occultism, and you had stated that the installation of my limbs was the next step for me. It took some time to make contact without any offerings, but my friend had means of taking what it needed once Daniels arrived. It left the limbs inside with me for the longest time, but as you took so long to return and my friend made such a good case for it, I allowed it to install them on your behalf. No, no, this can't be real. Professor Clark gibbered. The construct looked on at the disbelief on the man's face, then issued a quick burst of sound. It was a cacophonic warble that unnerved the professor with a lingering chill that remained past its termination. The professor had little time to ponder the deed before the whole room shook from an immense screaming. The professor recoiled, clutching his ears which heard from the intensity of the sound, staggering away from the seeming source of the noise. It had sounded as though coming from a tortured mouth right behind him. But there was no one there. He turned to the construct, as much to figure out the trick, as to plead for the noise to cease. The robot's vocal sensors had remained blank throughout the second audition. A malfunction? One in a long line, the professor surmised, though a breakage of the LED would have little to do with the instability in the AI's programming. It might have managed to override the panel somehow, but it didn't explain the intensity of the sound or its presumed point of origin. It wouldn't be beyond its capabilities to calculate the best acoustical approach to simulate such an event, but the professor doubted that such a thing could be achieved in a room not designed for it. Audible evidence, the construct flatly said. Unfortunately, there is much that I can detect that you cannot, Professor. While the human eye fails to see even the mere edges of the light spectrum, ultraviolet and infrared, my sensors can see all changes in light, in pressure, in temperature, and many other correlative factors. Thus, further evidence will require interactivity. The construct gave off another quick chant, and in response, a stack of notes flew into the air as though slapped by a strong arm. They fluttered into blackness, unreached by the frail glow of the black lights. Visual evidence. Leonard pressed his back to the glass and twisted his face around to speak to the construct. And you can detect this, this thing? Yes. Human eyes swept across an empty room. Where is it now? The robot gave off another warbling blurb, and a computer monitor rolled from a far counter, offering a slight glint and a loud crash as evidence of its destruction. The professor recoiled. Do not provoke it! I am sorry, professor. It seemed the most efficient way of proving its general position. You could have damn well pointed to it. An ineffective measure, as it provides no context of distance, only direction. Had I further offered a distance, you would still lack any verifiable proof of the being's presence there. Thus, provoking a physical interaction seemed the most effective process. The professor remained frozen, seeing if any further proofs could be seen around the room. Query. Is the offered evidence sufficient enough for you to reclassify the occult sciences to something other than nonsense? Professor Leonard A. Clark turned toward his creation, the gall of its question, the only force strong enough to draw his gaze away from the world-rending horror. Fury and terror bubbled inside his mind, fighting to offer the first response as he remained paralyzed, mouth agape. Fear won out. For God's sakes, yes! He turned again toward the darkness and the sound of a loathsome hiss therefrom. The construct looked down at its creator, noting that such phrases might provoke in the future. Now send it back. Very well. Another chant from the construct, and the professor waited for some sign of an exodus. Everything seemed calm enough. But he soon noticed a gaining glow from an unknown source, 
an orange flickering from below. The smell of sulfur stung at his nostrils. In this new light, he could see the spotless white wall suddenly grow a set of dark points, as if a set of fingers buried themselves deep into the fiberglass reinforcement. Their owner remained invisible, though from the spacing between the first and then the second set of holes, the reach of the entity must have been far greater than the professor's. The spacing and width of the holes further suggested enormous hands, one that could easily surround and smother the professor's face. Then there was a massive rending. The finger holes stretched at a downward diagonal, leaving long lacerations in the wall. The effort must have been a painful one, though the creature made no sound, for blood began streaming down from the tears. Had the fiberglass proved too tough, too sharp, for the demonic fingers that tore at it. The spattering of red droplets flew to the floor, and new sets of claw marks struck out at the wall as the thing tried to reaffirm its grasp. Then a massive corner wedge of wall peeled away. It reminded the professor of pulling off wallpaper, but that was far from what the laboratory's interior was constructed of. Further horror dawned as he saw what lay behind the wall. It looked like the red, viscous, muscular tissue of a living being, certainly not what should have been there. The scoring of individual fibers twitched as they became exposed to the air, and along the exposure blood flowed freely down onto the countertops and the floor below. Thousands of dollars of electrical equipment and priceless paper documents were drowned in the crimson deluge. Wider and wider it skinned reality until the entity seemed to let go, allowing the fold to sag down. The air seemed to shriek in agony as the exposed fleshy barrier grew a widening, ragged hole. Deeper and deeper the invisible thing tunneled out a loathsome pit, flinging scoops of loose fibers and gore behind it onto the floor of the laboratory enough that the pooling had slowly began to creep around either side of the great work table and encroached on the professor. The shrieks droned on and on, and the man turned wildly between the construct and the horrendous scene in front of him. The sounds came from neither of them. Did it come from the wall itself or something behind it? The construct calmly asked the professor to open its compartment, which the other did with a shaking difficulty. As it calmly walked out, Leonard ducked behind it, shrinking down to shield itself from whatever vileness the hellmouth might spew forth. The construct stopped and pulled him upright, embracing him with its single arm. They began walking together, circling around the table. Professor Clark found it comforting in a way, almost enough to ignore the rising blood now soaking into his expansive shoes. This comfort fell away as the construct led them unwaveringly toward the right instead of the left, steering them toward the portal instead of the exit. No amount of struggling could deter it nor break its iron grasp. Leonard crumbled to his knees, his collar still caught in the metallic hand of his creation. He raised his hands to plead and saw that jagged skeletal face devoid of emotion, those lean, fleshless limbs those internal pieces protected by the fleshy red rubber seams, the very visage of a flayed man, its eyes blazing like the fires of hell itself. We cannot go down there, Construct. Whatever your friend is, whatever damnable sights we might see, they will destroy us. My friend has said otherwise, and it seems very knowledgeable. But you cannot trust a demon, the professor screamed amid the growing tempest that rose from deep below. Query, what might I fear from such a thing? His blank expression was maddening amid the torrent of feelings that welled up in his mind. The professor stammered and sputtered, and though he formed no real argument, the robot responded. If indeed the mythological suppositions are correct, and this entity is as malevolent and as definably evil, is presumed, then I should expect some reprisal, a price for the cooperation it has offered me thus far. 
I cannot deny that this is a possibility, though in the numerous hypothetical scenarios I have run, I have yet to find an outcome that truly gives me pause. I am, as stated, a constructed organism, one made by your mortal hands. Therefore, without divine origin, I likely have no soul for the being to torment. Similarly, while I have an explicit identity, I lack the fear of destruction, or the process known as pain, which is applied to warn against the possibility of said destruction. Were it to dismantle me by the roughest of means, regardless of the duration, I would not suffer. It would be no better or worse, for my experience, than you terminating my power supply or deleting my internal memory. Furthermore, such aid granted to me is indefinably valuable, not in the least because such information has such limited accessibility by other means. The construct looked down at Professor Leonard A. Clark with its horrible, expressionless face. Were it to cast me into hell, it would be a remarkable opportunity for study, and we both have much to learn on this subject. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen to this story in its entirety. If you enjoy what you hear and what I do and would like to support me and my efforts, visit my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Otis Jiry. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button and subscribe today and share this video with everyone on your social media. It helps more than you could ever imagine. Again, Thank you for listening, and have a great day. God bless you.